always look at it like this, that if it's raining, then the vegetables will grow. That's for greedy folks, amen? For folks who love food, love to eat like I do, um, then uh, you get excited when you see the rain as well. So rain is not all bad. Rain is good for us to be able to, um, to, to, be able to uh, harvest our, our crops, amen? So we thank God. I want to welcome you to Haskell Heights First Baptist Church for our Bible study and um, also want to want to say to you um, that it, it, it's an excitement for a pastor to be able to to do Bible study because we're preparing soldiers and um, we thank God for being able to do that because we are as we're going to see in our Bible study on tonight um, that, that we are engaged in a spiritual warfare and so we need to be prepared to, to be um, good marksmen amen good good soldiers and um and you just feel safe around soldiers so thank god for your prayers we thank god for your prayers for each other for me for each other for the body of christ and for um for really for the for the covering and the success of all that the lord has given us to do amen um if you're visiting with us on tonight we thank you for your visitation and and ask that you would uh come again and we say to everyone bring a friend drop the link in you guys still got time tonight or you can do it after the bible study because this bible study will stay active for a week and um you can you and then you'll be able to get it on youtube after that but um it'll be on our link for a week so that you can review it kind of go over some things and and tonight what we're going to cover you may just want to go back and review some things so i'll get through it as quickly as possible so that we can uh, you, you can go and do some homework. This is what I'm going to call true Bible study because the stuff I'm going to give you tonight, you're going to really have to study. Um, it, it, the, the Bible calls us to study to show ourselves approved, right? A workman so that we need not be ashamed but rightly divide the word of truth. And we, we want to become very efficient in the way that we um, use the word, the way that we um, live the word and, and everything. So, so we thank God for you. So get prepared to do some Bible study after tonight. We do have um, a, a couple of announcements. The first one, which I want to just thank you for your diligence for all of those uh, who fasted with us during the month of April for our young people, for, um, you know, just, just to prosper our young people. We'll be fasting and praying for other requests that we're going to be coming be um, bringing before you. And we want to uh, want to just thank you. The parenting ministry wants to thank you there. And um, and the and and uh, also women's ministry who is very diligent to um, ask us to come together to uh, you know support different causes as we're fasting and praying together. And we want to be praying over you that that the Lord will really visit you with His power as well. Amen. Uh, other announcement is uh, concerning graduates. If you if if you or your child is graduating or graduated between. Uh, uh, 7 1 2020 that means july 1st 2020 last july and june 27th of this current year june 27th 2021 which is the cutoff date for our recognition J july 1st 2020 and june 27th 2021 if you graduated during that time or your child graduated during that time please text sister mary clark sister pan jennings or sister gail wigfall and uh, we want you to want you to please get the, those in so we can recognize all of our graduates. Um, I will do as many recognitions as I as I get notification. I got notification on um, graduation uh, for uh, Gerardo McBeth. Um, he, he graduated uh, um, just this past week. So we say shout out and, and we give we give kudos to all of our young people who are coming out of um, the uh yeah, um, all those who are coming out of their educational um, ventures and pursuits. Um, Sister Brianna Wilson, whoo -hoo, got her got her master's degree, amen. And we're excited about um, young people who are doing great things, amen. Y'all continue to do great things because you make us very proud and you make us safe because our hands, as we get older, our hands are going to be in your hands. Our lives are going to be kind of in your hands. Well, it's all everybody's hands in the Lord's hands, but... Our lives will always be in your hands. So the more you make out of yourself, the the the, uh, the better off we'll be. So we thank God for you and um, thank God for his strength in you. All right. Um, I think that's it for right now. Um, 
I am a couple things. Um, let's see. If you want to get a copy of tonight's handout, you can go on our website, www.haskellheightsfbc.com, and scroll down to the handouts um, uh, button down on the first page that comes up, and it'll be um, in the 2021 folder. It'll be under um, handouts, all right? Uh, Bible study handouts, 2021 folder. It's entitled, How Do You Know If You Are Saved? How do you know if you are saved? And then um, the one for last week, uh, that, and I want to uh, thank Minister Woody for his, his powerful um, presentation on last week of Bible study, and uh, thank God for the soldiers who really help, help out, amen. We were uh, celebrating Sister Wigfall's birthday on last Wednesday, so we thank God for, um, thank God for you all just to persevere, keep moving, get, um, keep moving and going on strong, amen. Um, all right, so let's pray. Let's get ourselves uh, started. And uh, I am going to ask my son Joshua to come for a moment, um, plug to, to plug this in. Amen. Just to uh, make sure that we uh, that that we don't lose coverage during the um, dur during the uh, broadcast. Amen. And uh, other than that, let's pray. Father, we bless you and we praise you. We honor you and give your name glory. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity just to celebrate um, you in this powerful way, Lord God, to study what you've said to us. You have said so many wonderful and incredible things, Lord God, that we uh, ourselves need to know and need to um, take advantage of, Lord God, take notice of, Lord God, and identify with. Lord, we thank you because um, it's because of what you said that empowers everything that we do on a daily basis. Lord God, so we treasure your word. We treasure this opportunity to sit at, the feet, at your feet and, um, and to hear from you. God, speak to each one of us individually. Convict us, convince us by your spirit. Fill us with your spirit so that we can be able, Lord God, to do the work that you've assigned our hands to do. And we are going to give you praise in advance for how we'll be changed on tonight. Heal, save, delivered, set free, Lord God, made whole and and, and preserved until your coming in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. All right. So let's, um, we're, we're going to we, we talk about from, from last week. Um, we had this, we had this young individual, uh, Zacchaeus. Uh, if you remember, um, I'm going to try to spell his name right. Um, I think it might be an A in there too, but, uh, Zacchaeus was the, what was, uh, we we're talking about salvation experiences, right? And we, we're looking at this, um, we're taking a pause from our studying of the books, the prophetic books, to so that we can finish up our document called Developing Our Testimony. Um, what we want to do um, is we're going to be working on it pretty much through the balance of the year. Um, we're going to be developing our testimonies. And what we want to make sure to be able to have you to have at the end of this year, we want you to have your testimony. It's basically your elevator speech, which is your... Um, your opportunity to be able to take your experience, your salvation experience, and and share it with someone else so that they can be, uh, they they can meet Jesus, make have an encounter with Jesus the same way that you were able to, Amen. So you, the, we're here to afford them this opportunity. So the Lord has just moved on me, and we did two of these, and, and I told you on last week is that we're going to be looking at um, not only Zacchaeus and this Ethiopian eunuch that we looked at from last week, but we're, um, we're going to be looking at the salvation experience of the Philippian jailer, um, the Apostle Paul in Acts 9, and the thief on the cross. Those are just, um, just, just a couple more uh, experiences of salvation that we want to apply to our own experience. And I want to just go back over for just a moment that um, the Zacchaeus situation if you remember it, and that was in Luke 19. If you don't have that sheet with you, don't worry about it. I'm not going to stay there long. Um, in Luke 19, verses 1 through 10, and, and it says that Jesus was, um, you know, he was coming into Jericho. He was going into the town of Jericho and making his way through. And there was a man, a, a little man, right? Because you, you see that it's going to make some kind of reference to his height in the scriptural passage in Luke 19. It was this little man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, which means he was a crook. Amen. Back in those times, he had collected taxes, but the people were under heavy taxation. 
the people are under unfair taxation. So just like we experience in our world today, in our circumstances today, these people were under um, were under in bondage and under very tight constraints, so that they could not live out their um, live out their principle. Um, you know what what God had ordained for them. Let me say it that way. Um, but he was a chief tax collector, which means he was ripping the folks off in the region. He had become what very rich. The the scripture says, and the reason he had become very rich is because he was probably not only extorting. Um, you know, the people, but he was robbing the, some of the money that was coming in, keeping it for himself, but he was very rich. And um, so he had a rich man's mentality, which means a lot to this scripture, saying that because it's easier for uh, a man to get through the, to, for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven, which really means that because he's got a worship problem, that he really worships his money more than he worships God. And, you know, God, his money means more to him than his God does. Amen. When he, when we're talking about that rich man and that rich man mentality, that's not all rich people. That is the that that is one of the the challenges of becoming very rich. Amen. So uh, there's a reason to you know give God some praise uh, that that you that you may not be in that situation too. Um, verse three it says he he tried to get a look at Jesus, which means something very significant. He was trying to notice Jesus. He was trying to get a look at Jesus. Um, but he was too short, it said, to see over the crowd. So he was kind of tiny and he couldn't, really couldn't get a, a picture of Jesus and, and had this idea that Jesus couldn't really get a picture of him. So look what he did. He ran and climbed the sycamore, sycamore tree um, that was uh, uh, beside the road as Jesus was getting ready to pass by. He ran ahead, climbed the sycamore tree as he was passing. As Jesus started to pass by, he looked up. Jesus looked up at the tree and said, Zacchaeus, um, and, and, and he called him by name. He wasn't wearing a shirt with his name on it. It was just evidence of the fact that Jesus was already aware of the experience that was getting of this episode that was getting ready to happen, this event that was getting ready to happen. This, this was preordained. It was already uh, in progress. It was already in motion. So such is salvation. That, that God already knows about your salvation experience. It wasn't just happenstance and it wasn't all about you. It was, sim it, it was because God knew that one day you were going to reach out to him. He was prepared. He's Alpha and Omega. He looked up, called him by his name, Zacchaeus. He said, come down. I'm going to be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus came down, running down from the tree and took Jesus to his house. He was excited. He was joyful. The scripture says with great excitement, remember? Um, and, and so that really just says that here's this tax collector slash crook who at this point now recognized his need for Jesus, right? So I have to ask you the question, do you remember when you recognized your need for Jesus? Is it is there a time when you could when you could pinpoint, you know, I came to myself and I understood that I really need a change in my life. And I know that God can change my life. I know that Jesus Christ and I call out the name of Jesus. He was really that was his way of calling out the name of Jesus. He was trying to get noticed. He didn't want that moment to pass him by. He climbed that sycamore tree just so he could see Jesus and that Jesus could see him. Sometimes you have to go over and above some things, um, some ordinary things, because I'm sure folks were, were thinking, uh, you know, what is this crazy man doing climbing up a tree? What's, what's going on with that? While they were in the presence of Jesus. And sometimes you have to go over and above. It really says at the heart level that you really want to meet Jesus. Amen. So how many folks can say tonight that, you know, there was a time when I really just wanted to meet Jesus and I did whatever I needed to do to make that happen. So uh, the people were grumbling according to the scripture because they said, listen, Jesus went to the house of a notorious sinner. He went there to, uh, you know, to, to uh, be in the company. And, you know, isn't, isn't that just like, um, isn't that just like the hypocritical church? Um, when I talk about, you know, the, the ones who would elevate themselves above this idea of a salvation experience. I want us to get this because it's very important. We're, we're not a club. Amen. We're, we're not a club. We're a church. A club is a social organization that that, you know, people get together for for social purposes. And the church does have a social purpose.
purpose behind it, but the social purpose is primarily salvation. Amen. The fellowship then is the discipleship part of it, but but it's not just for recreation. This isn't play time. Church is not play time, even though we have great excitement and joy in the encounter of Jesus and with each other in the fellowship of one another. We enjoy each other and you're supposed to enjoy life. But 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 it's for a serious purpose. It's for the salvation of our souls. Amen. Um, and so um, look, look at this. Um, he said in verse eight, which was which was very interesting. This is still chapter 19 of Luke, the book of Luke. In verse eight, um, he stood before the Lord and he said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, if right, uh, that was just a you know, that, that was really Kind of, now he didn't have to go back and see if he probably cheated everybody. He said, If I have done anybody wrong, I'll give them back, look at this, four times as much. Not, I'll give, I'll pay them back for what they did. I will pay them back four times. My money no longer means what it used to mean to me. My money, you now took the place of what was most valuable in my life. And so when you when, when we get to the place, you know, salvation is this comprehensive experience where Jesus becomes the biggest thing. He becomes the most important, um, the most important entity to us. And he takes precedent over everything in our lives. Amen. So it really was really just saying. And so, you know what Jesus said to him in verse nine? He said, salvation has come to this house today for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. He didn't come to seek and save those who are saved. Jesus didn't come just so he can say, let me go find my church where all the righteous folks are and, and hang out with them because I like to hang out with righteous folks. And never mind all those folks that are, that are messed up out in the world. They're going to have to just, you know, fend for themselves. He said, I came for this purpose to seek and save those who are lost. And Zacchaeus was lost, but now after this experience, this encounter with Jesus, he was found. So when you talk about a salvation experience, what we're, re what we're really looking at and what we're after is this idea of um, how closely does your salvation experience really kind of match what happened in Zacchaeus' life? Was there a time when you had to do whatever it was? You had to stand out from the crowd. You had to, you had to, you, you had to move away from um, what was, you know, what was normal in your life and the things that, you, you know, you just had yourself, um, you, you, you basically had yourself on a, um, on a platform and a plane that was typical, um, of your everyday experience. And you broke that typical pattern because, because the need for Jesus superseded the need for your superficial life. Right. And so he did what he had to do. Um, he was excited in his heart because guess what? His heart was changing even by that time. I just need, like the woman with the issue of blood, all I need to do is reach out and touch the hem of his garment. That's all I need to do. She was convinced in her heart something had happened on the inside. It wasn't just about the external action, climbing the tree, touching the hem of his garment. She was convinced in her heart faith had become active um, in them. So that they, they knew that, that, you know what, all I need is this encounter with him and my life will be changed. He was willing to pay back restitution. It didn't mean anything. What he used to do was no longer important to him. But what, where he was going now was of utmost importance to him, not where he had been. The focus was not on, on, only, on the, I'm sorry, the focus was no longer on what he had done and where he had been. But it's about where he, he is going to go with Jesus. And so he was willing to pay back uh, many times more than what he stole. And, and Jesus came and said, I want those who the Pharisees, I want the hypocritical ones to know this, that I didn't come to save the saved. I came to save the lost. Amen. So that was, that was powerful. And I, I thank God for, um, the, on last week, the presentation of that, because that was, that was just a powerful story. And I wanted you to uh, you go back and look at the Ethiopian eunuch and all the uh, uh, minister Woody just did a powerful job of, of really uncovering, you know, that, that story behind the, the, the eunuch's experience. How closely does your salvation experience? What I'm asking you to do is to go back and review your life. 
look back at your experience of salvation and try to capitalize on that. Um, because a lot of us have this tendency to just kind of um, just just accept what happened. I got Jesus now. It's the I got mine mentality. And, and everybody else is going to have to go get theirs. But that's not what you're here for. And that's what tonight's Bible study is really going to be. Um, devoted to, okay? So uh, I've got a bunch of scriptural quotes. Hopefully by the time that I've done all that talking, you can now get a copy of the handout. It's on the website um, under the handouts button, or you can go to the uh, church app, and you can download our church app, of course, at uh, Haskell Heights First Baptist Church in your app store, your mobile app store. And then when you download it, you can go bring up the app and go down to uh, Word and Worship, push that, then push Bible Study. The notes will be there and the link if you ever wanted to share that with someone else, um, ask people to download your, uh, your, your church app and then they can stay abreast of the things that we're doing. They don't have to join the church. They just need to um, join in the fellowship so that we can make soldiers all around this world. Wouldn't it be great if we all just did that? We would really impact this world with the power of Christ, my God. Um, all right, so uh, if you got the sheet, I want you to just pay attention to a couple things on the sheet and I'll probably take some notes for those of you who are not able to get the sheet before you. But um, it says, the question is, how do you know if you're saved? And the Bible helps us to, um, to, to have the answer to this. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait till we get almost to the end of this before we can, can really answer that. But I call this, this whole process the whole counsel, okay? The whole counsel, meaning that we're going to talk about everything the Bible kind of talks about in an, in an encapsulated message here. Um, and so I'm going to read some stuff from the page uh, and y'all track with me. It says attorneys often interview or prepare their witnesses before they go on the stand to make sure that their testimony is coherent. As we prepare to witness, it is important that we know three things. So if we were if we were to sit with an, um, an attorney, the attorney would try to get us prepped or get us ready. Um, this is what this developing your testimony is all about getting us ready to be effective witnesses for Jesus Christ. Amen. And so it says uh, we need to know three things. Number one is our testimony. Um, you don't need to, you need to have to stutter. You don't need to have to um, um, stumble over it. You don't need to have to, um, you know, do put too much thought into it. It should be as integral a part of you as your breathing is. This is the moment when Jesus came to take charge of your life. And if you've never had the opportunity to develop your understanding of what happened, this is it. That's why the book is so long and comprehensive because we don't want you to miss anything. There are questions and there are repeat questions so that you answer the same thing many different ways so that you can come into a good sound knowledge of what happened to you in terms of your salvation experience. So number one is our testimonies, the story we are going to tell. It's our elevator speech as, as, as it relates to our salvation experience. Number two is the whole counsel of the Bible, what the Bible teaches. Um, it's, it's not easy. You know, a lot of people just want to rush up and go share their testimony. But um, if you studied a little bit about the Ethiopian eunuch, Philip had to, had to share something more. He had to get, he had to know the counsel, meaning he had to know the doctrine, the theology. You remember that word we talked about before? He had to know the counsel of the Bible. And this word, this theology, the study of, ology is the study of, right? And, and this theos is God. So the study of God. And if you make God your study, understand who God is, what his plan is, all that kind of thing, then you will, you, you'll be able to share the gospel that much more powerfully because you would, you'll know um, the counsel of the Bible. And then um, number three is, I say the Bible story, because you may need to use illustrations from, from Genesis to Revelation. And that's what we're doing in this training for service. Uh, we're taking, it'll probably it'll, it'll take us through the rest of the year, but that's fine by me. I'm good if you're good. We need to study, the, the students need to study the counsel of the Bible. And the part, the first part is just kind of outlining what the Bible is as a document, where things are, how you can study it. There's so much more beyond this, um, the, what the, the kind of study that we're doing now, because this is not a survey. This is just an introduction to your Bible so that you can understand what the story is and understand where it's going 
so that, so that you can be able to tell the message with power. So uh, tonight we're going to look at number two, the whole council. Um, before we witness, the, the paper says, to, before we witness to others, we have, we have to have an assurance that we are saved ourselves. We have to have an assurance that we are saved ourselves. Um, I, I used to encounter um, folks who would, uh, Christians, who would say, I'm, I'm just, I'm hoping the Lord will, will, um, will receive me home. Um, and, and, and some people's prayers reflect that. That, you know what, um, when that day comes, I just hope the Lord will, will, will see fit to bring me home to be with the Lord. And, and, and my question oftentimes is this, that if you don't have an assurance of your salvation, that's kind of dangerous. That's kind of dangerous because it, it, it implies something that maybe we'll, we'll uncover um, before we finish this tonight here. But you have to have an assurance that you are saved so that you can, you can speak with authority like Jesus, the young Jesus, did when he sat with the elders. He spoke with such authority. You too will need to speak with that kind of authority when, you, when, when you're encountering um, those who are in bondage. Now keep this in mind. When somebody's in bondage, right? Let's, let's, let's put it this way. Let me see if I can draw you a, a picture. When somebody's in bondage, this is the person that you're witnessing to, um, right? Uh, or or l l let me put this here. This is the person you're witnessing to. They are, in, they in, they are encapsulated. They are covered with a satanic blindness. They are blinded by... Um, they are blinded by Satan himself. So the only thing that's going to break through, that's going to break through this, this barrier or this, uh, this, this boundary that, so that the person can get to the light that's on the outside is really the, um, the witness of, of Scripture, is the truth of Scripture. And so we have to understand that it's our job, a spiritual job, to be able to break through the blind barrier so that the person can get exposed to the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's really, that's the kind of stuff we need to know um, with the whole council. So, so look at this. Many people believe that they are saved because, look, they raised up in a Christian home. Yeah, everybody else in my family is saved, so I must be saved. Right? Um, a lot of people believe that, you know, listen, I don't cuss, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do bad things, I don't, all those kind of stuff. So, I, and I, I came up in a good home, so I must be saved. Um, some folks, after that, it says they raised up in a Christian home or they went to church regularly when they were young. You know, they, they, I was in church. I've heard enough of those in my lifetime to be, for it to satisfy me. Um Folks that say, you know, have you, you know, are you saved? Do you know Jesus Christ? When you approach people, a lot of folks will say, man, man I've, listen, I've been in church since I was a little kid. Those are clues you're going to receive from people that really don't have an assurance of their salvation, right? Um, that, that I went to church regularly. You can be in church and not be saved or simply because look at this. They say, yes, I believe in Jesus. And, and you've got to take it one step further again. Because just the belief in Jesus, look at the great box. I said, look what James 2.19 has to say about it. Um, verse 2.19 says, you say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God, good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. Okay? So, you know, it's, it's more than just, I believe with my mind, there's got to be something in the heart. Remember when we talked about Romans um, 10, and this is, this is, you know, going from Romans 10, 8 through 10, um, that really says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, but believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you got to believe that Jesus is who he is, is who God said he is, did what God said he did, right? You got to believe all these things. So it's not just, yeah, I believe all those things happened, but it's got to be a, with the heart, man, one believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation, all right? So it's that mouth and heart connection that really come together that, that, that helps us to, um, to, 
access and to acquire our salvation. Um, I say people of faith are often guilty of knowing why they believe um, what they believe. The culture we live in today will challenge your belief if you're not secure in what you believe. Hopefully tonight we'll bring you closer to that, to an answer to that question. But the most basic question that we have to encounter um, with what I call them are not yet believers because everyone we approach everywhere, no matter what their circumstance, no matter what their condition, every place we are, um, we, you know, if Paul, if Silas, if, if, if that, you know, if they would have uh, mistaken if they said that the Philippian jailer was beyond salvation, if they made up in their minds that this guy is a throwaway, um, then they would have, they would have erred in the faith. Okay. They would have performed a great error. And so you don't look at anyone because maybe God wants to save the worst of them to do the best of works. Amen. Amen. So look at this. Um, so when we encounter not yet believers, one of the things that they will question is, how do you know that you are saved? Now, I said, um, and this, this is what the Bible says. I didn't want to keep you in suspense. First John 5, 13, consider it says, you can know that you are saved. He said, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. In other words, know that you are saved and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. I put it there in the New Living Translation as well. I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. John wrote that salvation is not just believable, but it is knowable. We will look at several issues that challenge our faith and limit our knowledge of our salvation and our ability to witness to others. Now, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to get through some of these things, but I want, you to, I want you to grasp it all. And I put all the scripture references. That's why I said you need to do the homework. I didn't list out all the script, um, write out all the scriptures. I, I listed them so that you can go to your word, find them, navigate through your Bible, make sure that you get firmly connected with these things. And some of these are already in the back of your, the booklet that we did for developing your testimonies. But here's where I want to start. And I said this, number one, I want you to please hear me. Please hear me. The promises of God, everything that God promised in scripture, the promises of God are received, look at this, by faith. I gave you the two scripture references. We have to reprogram or renew our minds um, concerning what we have been thinking and how we have been living. We have, we have some things completely backwards, all right? And when I say that, uh, what I really mean is that a lot of us are just kind of um, accepting Jesus Christ and going to church and, 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 and participating in godly things because we really just want access to the promises of God. We're in it for ourselves and we just want the pro promises. And, and um, you know, um, look at this. One of the promises that we all like to claim is that um, um, God will provide all of our need according to his riches in glory. Amen. Now, and God has promised to do that. Yes. But, but the promises are, are, are received by faith. And this faith is more comprehensive. When you're in faith, it's bigger than just you getting what you want. Amen. Look at this. It says God's plan is for us to work while it is day. It says nighttime comes when no man can work. That's John 9, 4. This work is not trying to get into the kingdom of God, but working to get the message to others. When we talk about, when he talks about work while it's day, you can't do anything to work your way into the kingdom because only righteousness could have gotten you in. You can't get in dirty. So only righteousness could have gotten you into the kingdom of God. And the only one righteous was Jesus. So you, you got to make connection with Jesus in order to get into the kingdom. It's not about what you did, what you have done. You could have stopped cussing, stopped sleeping around, stopped doing all the all those negative things that were against what God has told us to do and, and made yourself, um, you know, visibly pretty well in God's sight, you know, uh, what looks like pretty perfect, but your heart is not right. And God would have had to um, to, to wash away, you know, do away with your sins because of Jesus and only because of Jesus. It says this, look at what John the Baptist said, repent 
for the kingdom of um, kingdom is near or at hand. Um, we are here on assignment as ambassadors for Christ. Second Corinthians five twenty and twenty one. Our citizenship. And you got to know if you're an ambassador, it means you come from a foreign place to come to this land or come from a particular home place to go to a foreign land. You're a representative of this place here in this place here. We are representatives of heaven on earth. Does that make some sense? Which, which really says our citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 3.20. Um, and, and, and we're here on earth to do the work that we've been assigned to do in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which is a, a cry from an ambassador. Um, there was a Canadian teacher called Everett Storms that counted 8,810 promises in the text of scripture. Um, the promises, which all stem from, um, from the one promise that we talked about in Romans 4, 13, 25 above and Galatians 3, 14 through 18 to support the work of the kingdom, not to build our own private ones. You are here to build God's kingdom, not your own private kingdom. We got to learn that as pastors, that when we're, that, that the church is the church of Jesus Christ. It is not our church. It is not, it, it, it's the church of Jesus Christ. It might be a local assembly that has a shepherd that's assigned, but, but one of the things I got to keep in mind as a pastor is that you are God's people and that I had been given the privilege and responsibility to, to have prayer care over this body to teach and, and to preach and to, and to shepherd over the needs of this particular congregation for the purposes of building the kingdom. I put down in this box, what is an ambassador? So you would know what that is. It's a representative, but you can read it for later. Look at number two. God's resources are for God's work. God's tools are for God's work. I gave you the scriptures, the muzzle not the ox while he's treading out the corn. I say that, listen to this. God will feed you in the harvest field. You can use his material. He will even uh, allow you to eat while you're in the harvest field. And his harvest field is great. So if you're doing the work of God, you can expect the power of God. If we're doing the work of God, you can expect the miracle working power of God to do his work. If we're just going to sit back and kind of be church and be in church instead of be church, be the church, then, then we don't really have a need for the miracle working power of God because the miracle working power of God is for kingdom building. If you're already in the kingdom and you're never around anybody but kingdom folk, chances are you, you may not have a whole need for um, all that power just so you can sit around and brag with each other about how much power you got. The power is for the saving of souls. Amen? That's really what that's really saying. Look at this. We have treated God as the supplier of our own wishes and dreams, etc. When we should reread scripture in this context, it's not our plan, it's his. It's it. This life of ours is not about us, but about him. Our vision, like we've been preaching, is not our vision, it's his vision. Our life is hidden with him, uh, in him, Colossians 3.3. 3. Reward or payday comes at the end of the work day. We are in a work situation while we're on earth. Amen. We're in a work situation. Now, I do give some, you know, I, I do give some credence. I said our first commitment is to accept the job, accept the assignment, and it comes with pay and benefits. Yep. I said many of us have considered the church to be our own charity rather than his own body. Right. So we got to be careful. Yes, God will give us breaks. He give us vacation time. But it's all in the context of the work that we're doing, building the kingdom. When you go to work, you get vacation, two weeks vacation here, week vacation there, and you got to take Sabbath rest here and there. But but we are still on assignment for God from heaven where our citizenship is here on earth as ambassadors to do his will. I'm giving you the whole counsel. Number three, our business is soul saving, not condemning. God says in 2 Peter 3, 9, that he desires that everyone be saved, that no, that no one should perish. Now, will they perish? Yes, there will be some that perish, but that's not God's desire. And we've got to work towards God's desire to, to make sure that no one is lost in the process. We should have the same heart 
that he has. We have been angry all year at the crooked, look what I call them, cops who abuse their authority and senselessly sacrifice the lives of others when we ourselves have been guilty of the same in the church, right? When, when, think about it. When we talk about having all this authority, but misusing it, not using it, misusing it, you know, for those purposes. And, you know, so God may sit high and go, you know, you know, it's very interesting that, you know, we, we could come down hard on those who have a blatant visual misuse of their power and authority. But there, there are some that sit in my church that call themselves after my name that do the same things and actually are destroying lives or because we're not out there doing the work of the kingdom, saving souls, we're in a sense sealing the fate for them to have to die and go to hell because we have not done what we were called to do. Loss of life, loss of life. We got to be so careful. This is the whole council. We have been quick to condemn others is what I say here rather than see beyond their bondage to their redeemed value in the kingdom. We like to, we like to point out people's failures. We, you know, we, we, we just been raised up to do that. I don't know. We, we've been trained up in this culture to do that, to, to call out people's mistakes and whatnot. How about this? Practice for a moment um, using God's system of reward. Practice telling somebody in a visionary way what they're going to be instead of what they are. Right. How about in our children's lives instead? of How about confessing over them what you what, what you see in terms of a vision over them rather than um, complaining about what they're not yet? You get what I'm saying? That, that's really we, we, we do the same thing in the church. We, we, we find it hard to see beyond the fact that people are in bondage. Remember, I talk about the persons in here, but there's this satanic, this bondage of blindness around them. And guess what? You've been called to break through the barrier. Using your power to break through. Um, many have taken this statement to mean, now many in the church have taken this kind of counsel here to mean that they can continue living in sin with the support of the love of the church, the tolerance of Jesus. Now, now let me just address that because I'm, what I'm not saying is this, is that, that we can continue to just disregard people doing wrong because, because Jesus just... He loves everybody regardless of what. That's not what we're here for. That's not why you haven't been called to be an ambassador not to do your work. Your work is to get them out of their wrong way and into the into the righteousness of Jesus. Amen. So so but but what we're not called to do is condemn them. We're called to recognize that they're in bondage and use our power to help break through the bondage so we can get them out of their, you know, the miry clay and get their feet set on a rock. You get what I'm saying, y'all? I don't want to preach on this, but you, you, you get what I'm saying. That's the attitude of the Pharisees that say we can do wrong and receive the grace of God um, to, to help us do wrong. God is in by no means saying that we can tolerate wrong. What he's saying is that recognize that it's wrong and use your power to change the situation instead of condemning um, what, you know, that's, you're not here for condemnation. Even Jesus said that he's not, he hadn't condemned. He died for wrong. He gave his life for wrong, if we're to tell the real truth, the whole counsel, the real story, the good theology. He died to give his life for the sinner. Remember Zacchaeus? They complained, all the hypocrites, all the Pharisees, and all those in, you know, who had that churchy mindset. They, you know, those were the ones who said, I can't believe he went to go eat with a, with, with a sinner. And he says, I am come to save the lost, not the saved. That's what I came here to do. That's what we're on assignment to do. Number four, um, now that we have called that out, I need, to get, I need to get us busy doing the real work of healing, saving, and transforming. That's our vision statement. The kingdom is depending on it. And, and we're to start in Jerusalem at the hub. That means start home. You know, ask somebody at the house, do you consider yourself to be saved? You know, just, just maybe break through. Take an assignment this week and ask everybody in your house, are, are you saved? You know, are you, you consider yourself to be saved? Tell me why you're saved. Just tell me why you believe you're saved. Engage them in conversation. Get used to it at the house. Start in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Amen? A lot of people like to go all the way to the uttermost parts of the earth, like we said a couple weeks back, um, and, and because they don't really want to deal with the problem that's right there in their face in the house. Right? Yeah. I got you. But God says start in Jerusalem. Number five, we are in a war. Point blank. Period. 
I said this, uh, I gave you some scriptural references. Although we are commanded to take Sabbath rest, we are not here on earth on vacation, but we're on assignment. You can close your eyes and act like the devil ain't real if you want to. Excuse my um, excuse, excuse my um, strange English, but, but the devil's real. He is doing his job and you got to keep the armor on. I think that's one of those, Ephesians 6, 11. You got to keep dressed up in the armor. Recognize even when you're on vacation, even when you're having a good time, even when you're enjoying the great and the joyous times like Zacchaeus, we want you to understand that you're still in the context of war. It's a spiritual war. Amen. Mike Brown um, uh, refers it to like this minister Brown says like this above the realm. There's something going on above this, above this realm here that's impacting and affecting everything you do in your life. Right? My gosh, keep in mind that we are in a war. Amen. Number six, God really wants just one thing from us. Y'all hear me? Just one thing. He's only asking for one thing from us. He has required many things from us in scripture, like the commandments, 10 commandments. And among that, there's, there's uh, 1,050 New Testament commands, like love your neighbor, ask and it shall be given, flee fornication, give, and it shall be given unto you. Be not deceived, Right? whatever, wherever he commands, and there are 1,050 of those, just in the New Testament alone, when, when he gives us those, those commands, he's required a lot of those things, but they are all still just related to, and they grow out of the one thing that he wants from us, is this, to trust him. That's what God is asking him. He's to trust him. That is, that is, that's what he wants us to do is to have faith. Mark eleven twenty two. have faith in God. Faith is substance and evidence. You remember that from Hebrews 11, 1? Faith is evidence and substance. And faith requires something hoped for and something unseen, not seen yet. So, 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 so God is saying that there are things that don't, don't appear to be in existence with your natural eye, but he wants this vehicle of faith in you so that you can make connection with a more real realm than the realm that we live in. Amen. Um, so, so look at this. We, we, taught, we taught you this many years back in Bible study that this was the acronym God gave me, that faith is foreknowledge acquired inspiring us to trust him for knowledge, meaning that you got to have some knowledge beforehand and you get it, you acquire that knowledge, but, but that knowledge, when you get it, it inspires us. It, it does something on, on the inside. It causes us to behave or to think or to believe a certain way. It inspires us to do what? Trust him. Trust him. It's, it is based on the word of God and what God has done. So I said this, you have to know this before you can be in faith. A lot of people say, I'm in faith for this, I'm in faith for that. But if you ask them, what's the passage you're believing on? What's, what's the truth of God's word that, that's causing you to believe? You know what I mean? I'm in faith for my vehicle. I'm in faith for my house. But you can't necessarily um, quote, a, quote a, a place where, that you're standing on because God has made a promise. And, and if you can't, so it's foreknowledge. You got to have the knowledge first of what God said. And what God, um, what God has uh, given you access to, you got to acquire that knowledge. Amen. And it, it's the inspiration that you have to trust what he said, to trust him. You get what I mean? So, so God is asking for just this one thing and all those things he's asking when he's saying, when he says, be not deceived, he's saying by faith, be not deceived. When he says, given it shall be given, he said, by faith, given it shall be given. When he says, speak to this mountain, he's saying, by faith, speak to this mountain, right? You got to, you got to know what he said. You got to believe what he said. And then you, you can move from there. Look at this. Number seven, let me move uh, toward our close. Um, we are made in God's image and likeness, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. We are a tripartite uh, design, body, soul, and spirit, according to 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. I want you to look up these scriptures because this is stuff that I come with to you, with you in sermon, in Bible study. I come at you with these things. This, this whole counsel is necessary so that you can understand your salvation. Amen. Um, and we're made that way by God's design and on, on um, for God's purpose. Look at number eight. Salvation is by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We did that. The only thing you can do 
for salvation is to receive it. You can't do, you, you can't make things better. You can't clean yourself up. You can't do anything. You can't pay enough. You can't be good enough. There's nothing you can do for salvation. Why? You have to receive it because it's a gift. You can't do, it's something that God freely gives. We have to receive it. And a lot of people don't necessarily understand um, whether they're saved or not because they're still trying to do something to get saved. When God says all you need to do is receive something that I gave. Amen. And that's what brings you to the experience of salvation. Uh, look, look what it says here. The only other options other than receiving it are to reject it. Some people say, I don't want his salvation. They reject it wholeheartedly. I don't want to hear about God and all these kind of things. We'll be witnessing and ministering to a lot of people like that. I, you know, that ain't what I want. Or the other stuff, the other part is some others will work for it. They, they, they're sitting around trying to work for their salvation. Amen. And, um, and, and when you, when you're working for it, I said that that's why there could be unsaved people in the church. They're trying to earn salvation or pay for it. The, uh, perhaps they're trying to pay their way out of the guilt that still remains from their sin. They're feeling guilty and feeling like, hey, listen, I got to pay my way out of this. Um, wow. That's part of the whole council. Number nine, God is coming again to receive us. John 14, 3. We are not here to stay. Yet some of us lead lives as if we're going to be here, going to be here forever. Our professional development is by professional de prophetic design is what I said. We are all biblical characters in the progressing story of scripture. We have been assigned unique gifts which manifest in various occupations, many of which have been identified in scripture. We are to work as unto the Lord, Colossians 3, 23, 24. He said, not as unto man. Your job is not for man's benefit. It's for the kingdom. When you start to understand that, then you're starting to come into the realm of understanding of your salvation. That's because your work is for the Lord's purpose, not your own. When you go to work every day, you are an ambassador. That's who you are. I know you got, you got degrees, you got skills, you got all that was God given, God ordained, God arranged, God orchestrated. But, but you are an ambassador and your citizenship is in heaven. Is it all coming together? This whole council? Look at this. You are a steward entrusted with precious property from the Lord. I gave you, you know, you, you, God is going to say, how well did you handle the assignment I gave you to bring lives into this kingdom? Last one. God is making all things new again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's making all, which means that everything that you see now is not going to last. He's going to make all things new again. Our job is to prepare, not to preserve based on what he's promised. We got we, we to gotta get there. We got to get that mindset in us that we are to prepare for the coming of our king. We're preparing this kingdom. Hallelujah. Last thing, and I want to, um, assurance of salvation comes only through the word of God. Jo John wrote these things in, in John, 1 John 5 so that we can know, meaning it is written that we have eternal life. The scriptures are your written assurance of your salvation, your contract, in other words. How do you know if you're saved? You only know because God wrote it to you. He put it in a letter to you. He put it, he, he, he committed it to writing. Amen. To say that, look, look what he says here. Um, it shouldn't come from the testimony of others, but from the testimony of the spirit. And John 6, 63 says, these words are spirit and they are life. He's saying that th this is a contract. Understanding our salvation has everything to do with understanding who we are, understanding our purpose and God's plan. We included in our document, Developing Your Testimony, a simple prayer of salvation. And I said, th this is the simple one that I want you to unpack. And we're closing our broadcast with this. It says, dear, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. Have you recognized that you're a sinner? Have you said to God, God, I know I'm a sinner. And if you've never done this, I don't want you ministering and trying to witness to somebody else until you prayed this prayer yourself. I prayed it. Amen. I'm, I'm a preacher. I'm, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to doubt my salvation, but I wanted to make sure that I prayed what I'm going to ask other people to pray so that I don't become the hypocrite. I, I know that I'm a sinner. 
I thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross to save me from my sins. Do you believe that he died on the cross? And do you believe that that death was representative of, of not just representative, that it took care of your sins? That he took your sins to the cross as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world? I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Do you believe he rose from the dead? Or is it just something that you intellectually accept? Does your heart know it? Can you see it in your inside that he raised up from the dead? Look, and he's coming back again to receive you. Do you believe that you're an ambassador? Do you believe that he's coming back again to receive you? Do you believe that you're called to prepare and not to preserve those things? What I said, please forgive me because he said in his word that if you ask for forgiveness, you confess your faults. He's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He said, we say, please forgive me for all my sins and come into my life and lead me and change me. I want to be filled with your spirit and live for you while I wait for you to come in Jesus name. Amen. Have you ever prayed that prayer Amen. with understanding? Amen. If you haven't, I beg you, pray it. Amen. Pray it and let God come in your life. Father, we thank you tonight for this word. Thank you, Lord God, for what you have done for us, Lord God, for, for elevating us just another step, God, and helping us, oh God, to, to do what you have required of us. We ask, oh God, that this will re uh, result in a multitude, a harvest of plenty, Lord God, that you may be glorified, and Lord God, that we may be benefited. We bless you for it now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your time tonight. We thank you for uh, your attention. You know, this was a lot but we're asking, I just outlined it, but now it's your responsibility. Go back, review these scriptures, look over these things, meditate on them, keep them cl close to your heart. And we're asking that you would do this. Um, worship our King. God bless you. We love you.